theme verse to, the, that we started off with, that Jack introduced us to? What's one of the themes of life under the sun? Vanity. vanity. All is vanity. <clears throat> All right, see, I, I'm doing me putting in the form of equation. That's what I do. So we're going to see life under the sun. Uh, he talks about all is vanity. That's the first part of the equation. <clears throat> and chapter 1 and verse, it's mentioned many times, but chapter 1, verse says, I have seen everything done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. And he proceeds to, now through the rest of the book, show how that is true. And again, life under the sun means he's considering what? Life with God or without God? Without God. If God is not in the picture, if as some people in the world espouse that we somehow came to being from one's little one-celled creatures, or whatever that is, then all is vanity. So we're going to be continuing. We looked at chapter 5 last week, the, the majority of it. And we, and we looked at working more over eats in darkness and much vexation and and sickness and anger. I got the sickness today, but um, if God's not in the picture, then what? Well, you work hard, you work hard, you work hard, you worry about the money, you worry about business, you worry about everything else. You get upset about how the politics of the day are going, that right or left or up or down or whatever. And with God, God in the picture, what's these? Let's use. You can't take it with you, as we you know, showed the emperors of China and Egypt tried to take it with them. And what happened? Did they take it with them? And who ended up with it? Grave robbers and museums. Uh, probably more grave robbers than museums. Um, and so in chapter 5, as we ended that, He's going. He, he sort of leaves. We sort of left last week with it being very depressing. It's like, why get out of bed? I tell you, there's some mornings I go to work and I'm going, why am I here? You got a bunch of kids who are half asleep or whining or, oh, and that's just Dane. Oh, <laughs> but um. We get that, but the, of course we know the chapter markings are put there by man, but the, at the close of this chapter, he's going, you know, there is some good. There is some good. And so life and understanding learnings, life's lessons. A, a, a few things came to mind as I read this, the rest of the chapter 5, and we, we're going to get chapter 6 here. A couple things came to Behold, I was good in fitting. I was going to say, what is good? this life under the sun. What is there? And a couple things sort of summarize some of this is that yes, there is evil under the sun. One of my favorite Agatha Christie movies. It's a great old time Agatha Christie movie by that name. Small moments of enjoying life or life is not about is not about waiting for the storm to pass but learning to dance in the rain. To learn to enjoy even when the bad things are happening. How can we do that? We're going to get to some passages where Paul talks about that uh, in some of the letters of his epistles. But as we get to um, as we get to this, last, as I said, the last of this circle of life, 16 and 17, to, to c come back to it, he said, this also is a grievous evil, just as he came so shall Toils into the wind and much vexation and anger. It's sort of like the circle of life. We have bad news and good news and bad news and good news and then bad news and bad news and bad news and bad news and, bad news and then a little more good news. And it seems to happen that way and the bad seems to be the good. And it seems Disney and me there is ah, Zavinia. And what happens in the movies? 
happen and good things happen and it all comes back around in a, in a circle. The water happening right above. Longfellow wrote, the best thing one can do when it's raining, let it rain. We can't, you can't fight it. We've got to take it for what it is and see what good there is in what we're experiencing. And that's hard sometimes. <clears throat> so what should I work for? Because he, he just got done saying, you know, there's much of it saying, why? Why? There's much of it saying, much anger, much... It's empty. Why should I work? You know, what advantage does the fool have? You know, what advantage does someone have over the fool? So we're going to see there's, he's going to talk about again, some good news and some bad news. As we're going to finish up chapter 5 with the good news, then we're back to more bad news. You watch the evening news or look at the newspaper, what's the ratio of good reports to bad reports? Uh, let's take a let's read chapter five, the end of chapter five, and we'll have some comments on that. And hopefully, you guys have some input as well, because I don't think I can talk for the full forty-five minutes. <clears throat> In fact, let me get a volunteer to read verses eighteen through twenty, chapter five, eighteen through twenty. Kevin. a lot there actually these few verses the good news Solomon goes behold look what I have seen in all this bad news what's the good <clears throat> and he says what it's good and fitting to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil which once with which one toils under the sun the few days of our life. I'm going to pick on a few people. Wayne, what's that mean to you? Okay. So, what's that mean to any one of you? Uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna, you're going to hear what he means to me here in a moment. But. So the work itself. The work itself, and it comes from that recognizing the blessing that we can put in effort as well. Okay. Come on, how about the guy with no voice here? <clears throat> Where's the enjoyment? Where do we find that? I think one of the keys that we're looking for is he's eat, drink, find, enjoy one's works. We enjoy these as physical blessings. Uh, as he put, you work, we receive some blessings from the work we do. We, and we're not going to go and find all the proverbs about the sluggard versus 
the hard worker or, or those types of things. But the key here is, I think this last piece that I put up here is, is little snippets. This is the, and this is the part of keeping things in perspective, is realizing that this is a gift of God. When I get up in the morning and I'm going to school and I know oh, the kids are just gonna, they're, they're just awful that day, what do I have to always keep in mind? That my ability to work helps influence the mind. That's God's gift. It, he give, he give, the, having work is a, is a gift. And when I can sit down to a meal at night with the family, or as I put Thanksgiving as one of my favorite national holidays, why? Because it has the three Fs of a good, of a good holiday. Family, food, and football. But... But it's what it's enjoying those. It's a time to enjoy, sit down and really, oh, to be thankful and enjoy those gifts. The children of Israel, when they uh, kept God's statutes, His commandments, His judgment, when they followed them and kept them, then they had peace. They would have peace for 40 years at, at different uh, lengths, and uh, all was well. They, they ate, they, they had all that they needed. God provided, and I think that is the key element that we have to remember. Yes, that we remember Him in all things, and then those blessings will come. But at the same time, if we are self-seeking, if we're looking out just for ourselves and not considering that He's providing these things, how quickly that will end. Exactly, which is why the key to this enjoying the, the things we have in this short life under the sun is understanding that they are gifts from God. Not like Nebuchadnezzar when he looked out upon Babylon and said, look what I have done. No, right? We have some example of someone who was blessed with much wealth yet realized where they came from. Job, right? Job, Job, Job had the idea, and when they were taken away, what was his response? Naked I came into the world, and the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But realizing it's the gift of God, and, uh, and enjoyment, and unlike some people in our culture today, What's this say about the wealthy? If, they, if the wealthy realize, and frankly, I think most of us in this room would be considered wealthy by much of the world's standards. Um, as long as we, is that bad to, to have blessed with wealth? What does it say there in, in verse 19? God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them. You're being given wealth, enjoy it. As we know from the New Testament and the various epistles, what? Instruct the rich to be rich in good works and to use that responsibly and realize it is a gift. It's freely given to you and freely give, freely give to others, but it's not a sin to enjoy it. <clears throat> I just, the page turned on me, I didn't even realize it. And to accept his lot and rejoice. All right. Being, is, is that, is, what's the word there? Contentment? Contentment? And so for, and, and here's the thing. It's the gift of God for he, that's mankind, verse 20, will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. I puzzled over this, and if you have a different viewpoint from what I'm about to express, please, let's, let's share it and talk about it. But in Philippians chapter 4, we all know this passage fairly well. <clears throat> Verses 4 through 9. Could I get a volunteer to read that, please? Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard 
your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. To me here, Paul in the letter to Philippians is telling them how God keeps us occupied. By doing what? Practicing the Paul things that they learned and saw and heard from Paul, which, in de- which deals with focusing on what is right and what is pure and what is honorable and just, and through prayer and stuff. Paul always looked for the good in he always, everything he received, he looked at as a gift from God. And I, and I put up there in the Acts 16.9, that's where Paul and Silas were in Philippi prior to really establishing the church to a, a great extent. And where were they? In jail. And what did, and the jailer heard them singing. Was Paul and Silas, were they occupied with joy? All right, so, so when I look at that, we, for you don't remember much of his day's life because we keep, we're taking day to day under this life and what? Looking for God's gift to us in that day. And I don't know what Paul and Silas were thinking about when they started singing, but obviously there was something worthy to sing of. And so we have the good news. There is good, right? We have a lot of good blessings. No matter how bad things seem to get, there's something good we can find there. Well, that's good news. And so our equation here, life under the sun, we have all is vanity plus what? Good to eat, drink, Work seems to cancel each other out. But that's sort of what life under the sun is, is these two things, isn't it? There's vanity, but realizing what it's from. So as we continue in chapter 6, we have the bad news. Once again, coming back to the bad news. As he continues that, yeah, okay, there is good here. But he can send you, and he just hits us again. By the way, I'm um, going back. I almost forgot. In verse 18, he says, "I've seen what's good." This is a theme. I'm sort of playing up the themes up there. We see vanity, the idea of vanity, can, many times. But already uh, in this book, at least two times, if not more, he in chapter two and verse 24, and chapter three and verse 13, he uses that same phrase. There's nothing better for a person should eat and drink and find of enjoyment. In chapter 3 and verse 13, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. It is one of those common themes that he's building. Yes, there's vanity, but there's also good and pleasure to be found in this life. So in chapter 6 here, he says, There is an evil I've seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is a little different than what he just said a little bit ago, wasn't it? So let's look at the contrast. Everyone to whom also God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. So which is it? What's the difference between the person who God gives the wealth, power, and the, and the power to, what's that power to enjoy them? Because that's the difference. In, in chapter 5, it's he's given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them. Yet a few verses later here in chapter 6, he says, I've given wealth and power and honor and not the power to enjoy it.
inviting them, can wealth blind a person? <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Someone in the back had their hand. And all three of you, is satisfied. it's coming back to, as Dave just said, it's not, not realizing whether it's the gift of God or not. And then how you use them. And if we realize it's the gift of God, we'll use it properly. But here, the person who doesn't get that power, who just is working for what? Who's he working for? Self. He's working for himself. Because if we're, as chapter 5 said, guarding our steps and we go to the house of God and drawing near and we're keeping God in our lives, who are we working for? We're working as for, for the Lord, not for ourselves. And so here's someone who's working for themselves, and God's saying, he's not going to get the power to enjoy it. What was the parable of the rich man that Jesus told in the, in the Gospels? But he filled barns and went to build bigger barns. And it was that night God required his soul. So what was who 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 enjoyed the fruits of his labors? Somebody else. It's actually a problem in Japan. Um, the culture is such that things for the, the men are supposed to work so hard, 70, 80 hours a week is expected. And they actually have treatment centers for workaholic or work addiction and, and, and it's a big health issue over in, over in that country. And what Dave's getting there is, is true as we get to um, <clears throat> The, the next verses, he says, he doesn't enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is a grievous evil, and he starts to expand on that. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so the days of the years are many. Now, was that an indication of wealth in, the, in that day? If you were the father of huge numbers of kids and you lived long, that was an indication you were probably very well off. But his soul is not satisfied, getting to what you were talking about, Dave, not satisfied with life's good things, and he has no burial. This is how bad this is. What's, what's, being, what's better than this man's life? A st I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Ouch. Jeff?
And, and, and you're right, that is our challenge, isn't it? To always see, and even in the worst of times, okay, what is what is there that God given me to enjoy? And, and it gets to us. We see, we mentioned Job earlier. Did his loss, and thanks to his so-called friends that came over, did his loss eventually eat at him and eat away some of that confidence? Yeah, he... he he eventually he got to the point where he, he said some things he shouldn't have, and God answered him, and then it brought him back to his senses. <clears throat> but he he's really going to hammer this home. If all you do in life is get up and work hard to accumulate wealth and accumulate wealth and accumulate wealth, and you don't take time to enjoy it, and you just work and work and work and work to accumulate this, a stranger's going to end up with it. But it's better off that you hadn't even been born, at least as far as life under the sun goes. What good has it done you? Because, as he said there in the end of chapter 5, it's much what? Verse 17, much vexation and sickness and <clears throat> works like that is just, that's all they're going to experience. So what good is life under the sun? Been? It's better that a stillborn child is better off than he. And he goes to explain that. For it comes in vanity. <clears throat> What's the it? What do you think that is? The stillborn child. Okay, the stillborn child. For the child comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has rather than he. As we all know, the, the, the child who is stillborn, where does that child end up going? It has none, no, none of the evils or problems or issues of this world. It has no, none of the vanity of life under the sun. And that child's better off because of that. It's hard for us to think of that. As he compares it to this, for using Dave's word, a workaholic. <clears throat> Verse 6, even though he should live a thousand years, going back to that person who doesn't get, who has all the wealth, and God's blessed him with all these things, but he's not enjoying them. He's not taking the time to put them in the proper context and enjoy them. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good. Do not all go to the same place. Well, what good did it do to work all that time Break your back, and but you end up in the same place. It's as Jeff was getting back to. It's he's showing what the vanity. It's just the vanity. I tell you, sometimes I, I don't know about other people's work, but sometimes in the realm of education, it seems it's vanity. As we go things over and over and over again, and some of them just never seem to learn. I understand that, but out of my faith in him, do I do I pursue forward? 
Exactly. And just a couple of verses we put up there. First Corinthians 13, the chapter on love. What does he start off with? If I do all these good things, speak with the tongues of angels, give everything I have to others, have all faith, and then just the personification of the the physical image of a righteous of a righteous person but do not have love what's it worth and simply it's vanity that's what made me think about this jeff And really what's he saying here, this, as Jeff put, this struggle is for what? Everybody. Whether it's poor or rich or whatever situation we find ourselves in. And so, um, I didn't put it up here, but also came to mind was the parable of the talents. God gives us as he says, he gives to some wealth and power and possessions. The five talent type person. You know, he gives us talents. He gives us things to at various levels, whether a little or a lot. And what were the people who got blessed by the, by, in that parable? The ones who took the talents, went out and used them. And as you talk about, and what you mentioned hiding, and I, I almost forgot about this, what did the one talent person get do. He went and hid it. He locked it away. He didn't use the little he had for good. For his what? For his good or his master's good? His master's good, right? And that's, that's what we're looking at here. Um, I just put Judas up there, better not to have born. That was what was said of Judas, right? In the New Testament. Now, turn to Ephesians 4, because all this comes down to, and, I, and Paul sums it up pretty well in Ephesians. Because did Paul experience the bad of life as well as the good? Yeah, Paul, when he was Saul, he experienced all the good that the Jewish nation had to offer. When he became Paul, he started experiencing all the bad physical things. Chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, he starts going on. And I wrote. I wrote the wrong passage, but it's learning to be content, right? He said, I found to be Philippians 4. It's supposed to be Philippians 4. I wrote Ephesians, sorry. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. After he talks about practice these things, right? he says, What? Not in speaking of being, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content, satisfied. All right? Snickers, satisfied, that's one of their things. Does it really? Maybe momentarily. Someone saying yes back here, like their Snickers. Okay. Um, Snickers satisfies. Yeah, for, for a moment, but then what? How much longer later are you wanting that again? So I've learned to be content, to be satisfied. I lost my place. And know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and of hunger in verse 12. Of abundance and need, I can do all things, and that's the key. I can do all things through him who strengthens strengthens me. So much of our life and our culture is in the pursuit of things. I was watching an old Star Trek episode, and this, this came up, and so it made, it made me think of it. Um, Spock says, in his words of wisdom at the end of a, of a show, 
you may find that having is not so pleasing thing as wanting. It's not logical, but it's often true. And so here, even people who, and I, 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 I don't know his, Leonard Nimoy is what his spiritual condition was, but the, I would have to say non-godly type people in, in the Hollywood area can write a little bit of wisdom from time to time that almost mimics what Solomon wrote here. You know, as Paul quoted the poets of, of the Greek day and, and brought out points. So oftentimes, I want, I want, I want, and then when you get it, oh, then what? I want something else. Now, when we're William's age, it's natural, okay? We haven't learned, right? But as, as older people, we, we should uh, be thinking of that. <clears throat> so back to Ecclesiastes. So he, cl- he finishes off chapter 6. For all the toil of man is in his mouth, but as, as we said, his appetite is not satisfied. What advantage has the wise man over the fool? Really, in this life, not much, because we end up in the same place. And, who, and what does the poor man have over who, him have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. And that was what made me think of of that thing from Spock. Better is the sight of the eyes than... I lost my place again, sorry. Than the wandering of the appetite. The wanting is more... is better than the actual having. And this also is vanity and striving after the wind. Hits that again. And he comes back again, Jeff, as you mentioned, to full circle here. That's why I start off with circle of life. Everything comes in circles. Whatever has come to be has already been named. That's what we talked about in chapter 1, right? Whatever has been is what will be. And it is known what man is, than that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what advantage, what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives a few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? We're here for just a little bit. And just a couple of points as we finish up here in the last five minutes. In James 4, he talks about what is your life? And he's just summarizing, you are a mist, something that's just here for a little bit. And in planning and working this life and working for riches and and so forth, what does he say? Instead, you ought to say, fill in the blank. If the Lord wills, we'll go and do this or that or make this profit or, or not. It's really saying the same thing. As we, and we all know this fairly well in Psalms 37, 23, the steps of a man way are established by the Lord. As we answer that question, what's he asked there? For who can tell, for who knows what is good for man? What's the answer to that question? God. And really it comes back around to it, and that's this equation and we could go to chapter 12, verse 12. And, uh, no, chapter 12 is not verse 12 in the end. What's his, what's Paul, what's, jumping ahead, the conclu- what's Solomon's conclusion? All's vanity. You can have a little good if you keep the right perspective, but what's the conclusion? Fear God. Uh, that's, that's our conclusion, right? Who knows what's good for man? God. That's their equation of life. It's full of vanity. Enjoy what you can, when you can, for the blessings of God. And in the end, fear God. And he, he, uh, Jeff, I'm glad you remind me of the, of the cycles here because he hits something here that he's going to repeat in chapter 12. He says, the more words, the more vanity. Are there lots, how many books are there out there 
that are self-help of how to do, live a better life? I mean, can, are, I, I suppose they can be counted, but it, it, and do they keep getting written, keep being written? They come all the time. And, and so for when I, when I talk to high school students, when I have those opportunities, when they ask me questions, that allow me to do this in verse 12, I go, this should be a student's, you know, whether high school or college, right? you're going to high school or college, this should be your favorite verse of all the Bible. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12, he writes, my son, be aware of anything beyond these. And what were the these? The, saying, the things written by God, God's word. Because they were, what, they were like nails firmly fixed that we could hold on to. He says, beyond of the making of end and much study is weariness to the flesh so there you go high school college students that should, should be your favorite verse right there uh, Dane at school you got start getting too much from those professors Ecclesiastes 12 12 read it um, can we not only with wealth and sometimes in pursuit of wealth can you attend all the business seminars in the world and you can just keep going and going and going and going, but what good does it do you? Right? There's the balance sort of like you were talking about, Dave. Go ahead. It looked like you had something. Well, I, I, I'm, just, I'm thinking about in death again when that time comes. When you, when you think of the Christians who've gone on before, when I think of the great examples That will end and close. Thank you.